it takes over a hundred hours to build a Bentley Flying Spur. In that time, the car goes through 84 different processes in crew. 141 different people work to hand make it. Three kilometers of thread go into the interior, stitching 64 different pieces of leather together. The side features the single largest piece of metal fitted to a road car. And the champagne coolers in the back, they can take two full-size champagne bottles. Now we've already driven the Bentley Flying Spur. My colleague Sean drove it back in the glorious summer of 2020. And this car made its debut at Speed Week in October. So why are we driving another Flying Spur other than why not? Because this one, that's a V8. Well, there isn't much extra to say about the V8 from the outside. It's worth noting, this really is a very handsome car. Just like the Bentayga we drove last year, they've taken the nice bits from the Continental GT and transplanted them with pretty good results onto the much bigger car. I won't bang on about the outside for too long because you've, well, you've, you've seen it, but there are a few features on this particular car that I do really like. There's the front for example, which is really bluff. It's very regal, which is great from the company that builds cars for the Queen. There's also other smaller features. It has the usual flying V on the front, which lifts in a very beautiful slow motion out of the bonnet when you unlock the car and then fires itself away when you lock it and will hide itself if someone tries to steal it for some reason. It also really wants you to know that it is a Bentley and it will not let you forget that fact. There is other than the B on the front. Little logos everywhere. There's two Bs on the wheels on each one, not only in the center cap, but also on the dust covers, in case you forget. There is a Bentley logo stamped into the carbon fiber sills. When you open the door, there are Bentley logo puddle lights. It really won't let you forget. There's also, speaking of those sills, carbon fiber all over the place. It's got carbon fiber sills, it's got a carbon fiber chin, it's even got a carbon fiber spoiler on the back, because this is the lightweight, sporty model, obviously. There's also black surrounds everywhere, just to remind you that this isn't a, some old stuffy chromed thing. Although if you walk up to some of them and touch them, you'll notice they're a little bit plastic. In this rather nice British racing green and a black grill, it really is screaming, get out of the way. Enough about the outside. You know what it looks like. It, it looks like a Bentley. What you want to know about is what's in here. And if you're buying a flying spur, you want to be sat back here. If you're buying a Bentley to drive, to sit up front, you're buying a Bentayga or you're buying a Continental GT. No, you want to be sat here with someone else driving you. These seats, I mean, to call them seats is doing it a bit of an injustice. They're more, they're more chairs. And these aren't even the nicest seats you can get in the back of a flying spur, but they're still fantastic. You feel cosseted and comfortable and you can adjust them in almost every single manner that you could imagine. And they even have pillows. Yeah, they've got pillows on the back of your headrest, the sort of winged style that you get on an airplane where you can fall asleep to the side. You can have a tray table in front of you. And one of my favorite things, which you'll find in other Bentleys as well, is this little screen, which you can pop out. Well, it doesn't pop out, it sort of presents itself to you and you can control almost anything you want on this. You can change the radio station, you can change your climate control. You could even find out how fast you're going just in case Jeeves who you've hired isn't quite getting you there fast enough and you can give him a clip around the ear hole, although I'd probably need some kind of stick. There's also features like the very useful champagne cooler which can be found in here and can be, and I quote this from Bentley, stocked to suit any occasion. I therefore have got nothing. Oh well. There's plenty of power for if you need to work on your way to whatever meeting it is you're being driven to. They're USB, and they're not actually USB-C, which is interesting. But if you have spent 150,000 pounds on your flying spur and you haven't got the cash left over for the driver, you're gonna find yourself up there. If you are forced to sit up here, let's be honest, you're not going to be slumming it. It's, well, I mean, it's, it's 
beautiful. Everything is controlled as you would expect on a car today with a couple of giant screens. There's one in front of me that's entire digital and then there's this humongous touch screen in the middle, which is 12.3 inches. And I am sure that I have lived with televisions in my home that are smaller than that. But if you're driving along and you don't want something as gauche and modern as a touch screen, then you can just touch here and it'll disappear and it'll be replaced with some nice old fashioned dials and you'll feel like you really are in a Bentley. There's also there's little touches that you, you don't notice until you sit inside, like the fact that the, the edges to many of the switches, like the volume controls and stuff, replicate the pattern inside the lights on the outside. You can customise this to your heart's content, although one of the foibles is that if you've bought a car like this and then you end up touching some of these beautiful wood bits, because they're so laminated, there's just fingerprints everywhere. And once you're done playing around with swinging that screen backwards and forwards, which I know you can keep doing and you won't get particularly bored, there's so many other things to play with. You've got a heated seat, you've got heated steering wheels, you've obviously got climate control, you've got blinds in the back and on the rear window that you can put up and down anything. And it's just little touches like when you want to reveal the cup holders after you've had your champagne in the back, the movement is just, ah, it's just really nice. Now the main change between the other flying spur and this one can be found in here. The launch flying spur came with a honking great 12 cylinder engine, which had its cylinders arranged in a weird sort of awkward double V. It's called a W12. This one has a good old fashioned V8. Actually, it's four liters, but because this car was designed to also take a massive W12, it was quite small. That V8 is twin turbocharged. It's based on the same TSI unit you'll find in the Bentayga and various other Volkswagen Group cars. Here we find 550 PS and 770 Newton meters of torque, which is both significantly less than the W12 and more than enough to shred Pluto. <laughs> All that torque is delivered at just 2,000 RPM in a pretty flat curve, which means you're just a flick of the toe away from speeding away from any oiks who happen to get in your way. Peak power is at 6,000 RPM, and the Bentley Flying Spur will wang its way on to 198 miles per hour if you need to cross the continent tomorrow. More importantly, 60 miles per hour is reached in four seconds, which is not bad for a car that weighs 2.2 tons. The most important thing here though, is that the V8 is 100 kilograms lighter than the W12 that it replaces. That's like literally removing me and all of our camera gear and then still having to shave some more weight off. And this isn't just an off the shelf, simple to use, simple to fix V8. There's some proper tech in here. To better manage the packaging of the engine itself, the two turbochargers have been positioned inside the V. That also means exhaust gases don't have to travel as far from the cylinder to the turbocharger, minimizing lag. Because if you're drinking champagne, a sudden burst of unexpected acceleration is just not on. Weight reduction, the better center of gravity, Combined with Bentley drive dynamics and the optional rear wheel steer, Bentley say have increased the flying spurs agility, which is, I must point out, their word, not ours. Because as much as you can do to a 2.2 ton car that's over five meters long and designed to waft around, agility is it's just not the word. I'm sorry, Bentley, it, it, it's not an agile car. Which is not to say it's a bad car. No, no, it's incredibly impressive. That rear wheel steer, which steers against the steering when you're at lower speeds and with the steering at higher speeds for better stability, means you can turn this car around in not much further than its own length. Which is quite impressive when you're trying to maneuver something that is 
the size of a Bentayga and feels sometimes like it's the size of a bus. It's also surprisingly economical. It's got cylinder deactivation below certain speeds, which means it basically turns itself into a really big Golf, the two litre four cylinder engine at that point. But altogether, Bentley recommend it's got about a range of 440 miles, which is enough to get you to Champagne to pick up the latest stocks and not quite all the way back. But we've managed, look at this, I think we've managed around 21 miles per gallon, which is decent actually for something like this. Something so smooth in its torque delivery, not relying on everything being miles up the rev range. That's very impressive. There's no real feel to the steering. It's not light, it's not sort of horrible and wafty light, it's just there. It'll do what you want. It feels like it, it gives you some responses to what's happening, the ones that it thinks you expect, but I wouldn't rely too much. The brakes are extremely good. You've got to put some force into it, but it just doesn't feel like you're pushing anything other than a sponge. It's not sort of really giving you any feedback on what's going on. Throttle response is fine. It's quite good, actually. There are very few cars that can justify, really deep down, a £150,000 price tag. And in that bracket, there are very few cars that can actually stand up to the flying spur. Maybe the 7 Series and the A8, but more likely the Ghost or the S-Class. But there's just, there's just something about the flying spur that sets it apart. I'm not sure if it's the history behind the Bentley name, or the fact that this car still feels a little bit more refined than the gadget-laden Germans. But the Flying Spur just has a little something else that keeps drawing you in. 